Let's see here. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Dumont, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington student ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics here at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's event. Our mission at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and also strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates, and throughout the academic year, the politics department is alive with the coming and goings of candidates, political pundits, journalists, and other individuals and groups from all over the political spectrum. Before we continue with this afternoon's program, we'd like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or any other noise-making uh, devices. Uh, I would now like to turn things over to my colleague, Taylor Francis, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. So my name is Taylor Francis, and I'm a psychology ambassador here at St. E's. So thank you all for coming out to the annual Heckel Lasky Lecture Series. This series honors former faculty members Richard Heckel, who founded the psychology department here at St. Anselm, and also Jack Lasky. Both Heckel and Lasky devoted their careers to promote wellness through basic and applied psychological research. This drive cultivated deep tradition in using psychological science to help solve the problems that people face. This year's featured speaker, Dr. Callie Thomas, is an assistant professor of health services, policy, and practice at Brown University School of Public Health. With a background in aging studies, gerontology, and healthcare research, Dr. Thomas's research focuses on identifying ways to improve the quality of life in older adults needing long-term services and support through applied health services research. With funded research from the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, the National Institute of Aging, and other foundations, Dr. Thomas has led research projects related to the quality of care delivered in long-term care facilities, along with the role of community-based services in preventing or postponing nurse home, nursing home placements. Today, Dr. Thomas will prevent, or present the evolution of our home-delivered meals research program, along with the results gathered from examining the impact of these services. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kelly Thomas. Right, thank you to the student ambassadors for that warm introduction, um, to Professor Rickenbach for the invitation to be here today, and to all of you for joining to listen to um, some research that I've been conducting over the last several years documenting the impact of home delivered meals programs. So in my talk today, I'm going to start by sharing with you the journey that um, I've taken, which started as looking at um, outcomes for residents with low care needs in nursing homes to standing here today five years later with three funded studies and a body of work documenting the impact of home delivered meals. I'll then share with you some of the policy and practice implications that have come as a result of this work as well as some of the ongoing and future research that we are currently conducting um, in the same vein. But before I launch into my talk, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, the funders of the work that will be presented today, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AARP Foundation, and the Gary and Mary West Foundation. And then um, I also must disclose that I do receive consultant fees from Meals on Wheels America, which has um, potential conflicts for one of the studies I'll be discussing towards the end of my talk. So let's get started. Um, for, so in the last two decades, we've seen an increase in home and community-based services, both in an effort to reduce costs for long-term care, but also in respect for individuals' preferences to remain in the community in lieu of institutions. But despite um, the increases in home and community-based services, there's still an alarming proportion of residents in nursing homes who have needs that don't necessarily necessitate um, nursing home level of care. And we call these individuals, um, they're defined as low care residents, meaning that their needs could perhaps be cared for in the community. There's been a body of uh, research that's documented the relationship between predictors of low care residents in nursing homes. Um, so a study actually led by your very own Professor Rickenbach um, has found that Medicaid spending is associated with, um, increased spending in Medicaid programs for home and community-based services is associated with decreases in low care residents. We know that having more assisted livings in the area decreases the proportion of low care residents. But what was really missing from the literature was the impact and the relationship of social services, um, such as those funded by the Older Americans Act to low care residents in nursing homes. 
So just a brief history lesson. Um, the Older Americans Act was passed in 1965 in response to concern by policymakers about a lack of community social-based services for older adults. Title III of the Older Americans Act, um, which is the largest title of the act, funds um, essential and critical services such as home-delivered meals, personal care assistance, um, services that are delivered in the, in the home, like homemaker and chore services, case management, transportation, and elder rights and elder justice. And they help about one in five or 11 million older adults um, remain as independent as possible in the communities. And what's important about the Older Americans Act program is that it's not means tested like Medicaid, meaning that you don't have to be um, completely impoverished to access these services, but rather they're available to older adults who meet criteria um, for eligibility over the age of 60. And although individuals may receive services from other federal programs, they are, um, it is the, the Older Americans Act is considered to be the major vehicle for the delivery of nutrition and social services um, to this group and their caregivers. So in a paper that I published um, back in 2011 with my colleague Vince Moore, we examined the state's spending on all of these Older Americans Act services, as well as Medicaid spending on home and community-based services, and changes in the low-care population in nursing homes. So we had data um, which spanned a decade from all of the states, and we looked at how is when states increased spending, if there were concurrent changes in the low-care residents. And what we found was that over this time period in all of the programs that we looked at, that the one program where we saw increases in state spending and decreases in low care residents and nursing homes was home delivered meals. And as you can see, we looked at um, a variety of different services, including Medicaid spending. And I remember when I first presented these findings to my colleagues internally, they scratched their heads and they looked at me and they were like, I don't get it. How are meals keeping people out of nursing homes? And what people didn't understand is that these five meals that are delivered to individuals' homes during a week provided so much more than a meal. And as a Meals on Wheels volunteer and a granddaughter of a Meals on Wheels recipient, it made total sense to me as to how home delivered meals were keeping people independent in their community. Um, home delivered meals recipients, so the clients who receive these meals, by nature of their um, participation, are homebound, meaning that they're unable to leave their house. And for many individuals, the meal delivery um, person is the only other person that they see during the day. And I can speak to this having been a Meals on Wheels volunteer is that a number of the older adults on my routes, I was the only person that they saw and spoke to. So it provides socialization and an outlet to the outside world. In addition, um, home delivered meals have a safety check built into them, meaning that any delivery that's unanswered, it's then followed up on by the Meals on Wheels program. So the office will call the client or their caregiver to see why they didn't answer that day and then appropriate actions are taken to, um, to check on their safety. And so these results were really the first of its kind to suggest that um, home delivered meals had benefits up and above nutrition alone. And so needless to say, the aging and nutrition networks, policymakers and the media had great interest in this study. And it was referenced in um, the media quite frequently, including in The Atlantic, USA Today, um, The New York Times, CNN, uh, again in The New York Times. And with all of this media attention came a lot of questions. So I received countless emails and phone calls um, from providers and policymakers saying, what do these results mean? Tell me how I can translate a coefficient or an effect estimate into something meaningful for my state. Um, so in an effort to conduct a study that was somewhat digestible for readers and uh, providers, we published a follow-up study in Health Affairs in which we basically calculated how many additional clients would need to be served for a state to recognize savings. So, or to put it another way, how much does a state have to spend in order to save money um, through their home delivered meals program? And what we found was that nationwide Medicaid programs could have saved over $109 million by increasing their population of older adults in their state receiving home delivered meals by 
Um, the states that are in the darker gray shade here on this slide uh, were projected to save money by actually serving more people. And these were states with a high proportion of low care residents. Um, they had high Medicaid per diem rates and a small population of older adults. And in fact, New Hampshire, using the estimates from our model, um, was projected to save uh, half a million dollars or excuse me, five, 500, yeah, 500,000, 497, I think, thousand um, dollars by actually serving a 1% across the board expansion in um, their older adult population. However, the lighter gray states, um, namely California and Florida and Texas, or those that had a large population of older adults, they were not projected to recognize savings at first, but rather would have increased spending. And this is likely because um, they have a large older adult population, so a 1% across the board increase um, would, it, it would, take, it would take longer for savings to be recognized. And so, um, Having seen these findings, in 2013, Meals on Wheels America hired, um, or they hired a new president and CEO, Ellie Hollander. And her first week on the job, she walked in and programs were hit with sequestration back in 2013. And she was familiar with our work and called me up and said, let's meet and chat. I have some challenges and I need some help thinking about ways that our programs, we can help show the uh, document its effectiveness. So she shared with me that in addition to funding cuts, federal funding cuts and state funding cuts, as well as increased transportation and food costs, that her programs um, were serving fewer seniors, that there were fewer meals being delivered, and that um, Meals on Wheels programs across the country were now experiencing increases in their waiting lists for home delivered meals. And so in addition to these challenges, um, there was also a new competitors in the market. So for-profit companies had recognized that um, there's a growing population of homebound older adults who need nutrition assistance. And so they have um, created a new lower cost model of delivering frozen meals to clients. So instead of the daily interaction um, provided through the tr traditional service, uh, meals are drop shipped through UPS or FedEx and are left on clients' front doorsteps. Um, so it thereby limits some of the benefits that we many believe are um, one, if not most beneficial aspect of the traditional model. So together with Meals on Wheels America, which I should say is the national provider um, so, or National Association for Home Delivered Meals Providers in the country, um, we designed a study that we called More Than a Meal. And the aims of this study were first to characterize the growing population of older adults on waiting lists um, for home delivered meals. The second aim was to evaluate the impact of home delivered meals on their well being. So we looked at things like loneliness and mental health, um, ability to remain at their home, self reported falls, and hospitalizations. And I'll share some of those findings with you. And then the third aim was to evaluate the comparative effectiveness of the meal delivery methods. So were clients who received the daily delivered meals, did they have better outcomes than those who received the frozen once weekly delivered meals? And before I launch into this study, one thing I forgot to say at the start of this talk was um, we have lots of time built in at the end for questions and a discussion. But if you have any clarifying questions that you'd like to interrupt and ask, please feel free. Um, I work with a bunch of economists, so I'm totally used to being interrupted um, when giving research presentations. So just, you know, pipe up if you have a clarifying question. Okay, so for the study, we designed a three-arm parallel um, randomized controlled trial. And one thing that has made understanding the effects of nutrition programs, particularly home delivered <coughs> meals, really challenging is that in order to have a really robust, rigorous evaluation, you need to have a control group. Um, but ethically, you can't withhold meals from someone who says, I need meals for the sake of research, right? Um, but with this growing waiting list of home delivered meals, for home delivered meals, we were able to use the waiting list as a control group. And with our funding, we pulled people off of the waiting list and we provided them, um, they were randomly assigned to either receive frozen once weekly delivered meals. Um, so this is the new drop shipped type um, of meal delivery or to receive the daily delivered meals or to remain on the waiting list. So. Everyone's on a waiting list, and then we randomly assign them to one of these three conditions. We worked with eight programs across the country, 
and we enrolled 626 participants. Um, we conducted a survey at baseline in their homes and then 15 weeks later by telephone. And our results from the first aim of this study found that older adults um, on waiting lists for home delivered meals need a variety of support. So we published this in the Journal of Applied Gerontology. And what we found was that a staggering number of older adults that are on waiting lists to receive home delivered meals, so these are people who need it but aren't yet getting it, um, have very little social support. So for example, 18% of participants indicated that they had contact, any contact, with friends or family once a month or less. Okay, 14% um, of individuals on waiting lists said they had no one that they could call on for help if they needed it in the case of an emergency. Individuals on waiting lists were twice as likely to screen positive for depression or anxiety with almost a third of the sample exhibiting these symptoms according to um, clinical indicators. Three times, uh, or individuals who were on waiting lists were three times more likely than the national population of older adults to have fallen in the last month with almost a third of these individuals reporting a fall. Participants also had worse self-rated health than older adults nationally. 71% um, of the sample uh, rated their health as fair to poor compared to 26% of seniors nationally. Over half needed assistance with personal care activities. Um, so this suggests this is a really vulnerable group. And um, I presented this work at, um, the, at a, as a presentation in Australia to their National Association of Meals on Wheels providers. And they were less um, enthusiastic about the idea that we conducted a really rigorous randomized controlled trial to evaluate home delivered meals as they were in the fact that America has waiting lists for um, home delivered meals. They just, that, that blew their mind that there are older adults in this country that need nutrition assistance and there's not funding or supports available to provide that to them. And so they're sitting there waiting. Um, and with these types of um, characteristics, it's not a very rosy picture. Um, so in addition to understanding these individuals' needs and their characteristics, we also found that it's not only important because of the high rates of these um, poor, out poor outcomes and um, characteristics, but it's also feasible to assess these needs, meaning that programs currently aren't collecting this information because they don't have to, um, but they could and they can ask these questions um, to get this information. And in the second name of the study where we compared individuals who received meals regardless of meal delivery type to the control group who didn't receive meals, we found that those who received home delivered meals had um, improvements in their loneliness as well as their um, security or their beliefs about their ability to remain at home. We also found that individuals who received meals had decreases in anxiety, in self-reported hospitalizations, and self-reported falls. And um, this should be AIM-3, that's a typo, but AIM-3 results where we compared individuals who received the daily delivered meals to those who received um, once weekly delivered meals. We found that those who received daily delivered meals had improvements in loneliness, um, improvements in their feelings of safety as well as their security in their ability to remain at home compared to those who received the frozen once weekly delivered meals. Um, we also found that those who received daily delivered meals had decreases in anxiety and falls compared to um, those that received the frozen delivery meals. So these, as I mentioned, um, you know, the prior work was one of the first to show that um, home delivered meals had impacts on healthcare utilization and things up and above nutrition. Um, this was one of the first randomized control trials to evaluate the impact of home delivered meals on well-being and self-reported health um, and healthcare utilization. And so the these results um, informed and changed some of the Meals on Wheels programs practices as well as policies. So I'll share some of the highlights with you. Um, so as a result of this study, a number of programs have begun um, collecting data and thinking about evaluation. So one program in particular that participated in this study now is using our survey and methodology um, for all of their clients. So they're assessing um, clients when they are come into the program as well as once a year so that they can begin to understand the impact of their services. And this may seem like a no-brainer, but um, 
you have to remember these programs, a lot of them are intrinsically motivated. They're, they're not thinking about ROI or effectiveness. Um, really, they're like, we have people who need meals. Of course we're going to provide meals, rather than making the business case for why they should provide meals. Um, I've also been working with a state unit on aging who's planning to use these tools um, for across the state to understand its nutrition programs. There's also been um, an increase in programs partnering with uh, local area agencies on aging to screen for depression and anxiety and offer false prevention programs. Um, and the National Nutrition Network has recognized the importance of moving from focusing on how many meals are we providing to what are the um, effects of the meals we're providing. So going from outputs to outcomes. And this is evidenced by the many webinars and trainings and conference workshops that are available on the topic. Um, I recently spoke at the Institute of Medicine discussing the not only the need but the ability to measure impact and outcomes for these programs. And I think what's most exciting to me as a researcher is that um, programs are taking the findings from these studies. We've created infographics and um, pictures and uh, like outlines, like really digestible information, and they're taking it with them to talk to healthcare payers and providers and saying, you know, this is what we do for people in the program or in the community, um, and this is how we help seniors that we serve. And I think most importantly, this research is really helping home delivered meals programs um, secure their place in the delivery of long term services and supports. And this research has also informed policy discussion. Um, I've been part of state legislative testimony in Rhode Island. It's also been featured here in New Hampshire as well as a, um, a handful of other states. Um, the research has appeared in congressional testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means, um, Subcommittee on Nutrition, the Health Committee, uh, just to name a few, as well as um, featured in discussions during the White House Conference on Aging a few years ago. And we've seen changes in nutrition policy over the last several years. Um, so I mentioned in 2013, programs across the country were preparing for and responding to sequestration. Um, at, in 2014, funding was restored to the Older Americans Act to the pre-sequestration levels. And I just want to mention that um, that restoration of funding was the first time that nutrition programs had seen any increases since 2009 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or the ERA dollars. Um, so that was, and even prior to that, that was like funding in the last decade. So, um, so th those were big changes. In 2015, the fiscal year budget increased funding for nutrition programs by $20 million. Um, at the end of the year, a na the National Commission on Hunger, which was a congressionally appointed bipartisan committee, released recommendations um, which cited this research saying that, um, that Medicare and Medicaid should provide reimbursement for meals given their impact on health and well-being. In, um, and just recently, last Friday, Congress passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018, which um, it added an additional $59 million for um, the last six months of fiscal year 2018 for nutrition programs. And these policy changes have even trickled down to the local level. Um, in 2014, the Rhode Island General Assembly appropriated an additional $300,000 for Meals on Wheels programs, which restored the funding to what it was a decade ago. So this was the first time the funding levels had reached what it was a decade ago before cuts took place. And while obviously I can't take credit for all of these policy changes, I can say that having the research to inform the discussions um, definitely helped make the case for investment in home delivered meals programs. But we've still got a long way to go. Um, the current state of home delivered meals programs is rather dismal. Um, today, 10.2 million older adults, or about one in six, struggle with hunger and need nutrition assistance. And a report released in 2015 by the Government Accountability Office found that 83% of in older adults who are food insecure and 83% of those who are physically impaired do not receive services from um, the Older Americans Act funded meals. The Meals on Wheels America Network is serving 23 million fewer meals than it did in 2005. And one in four Meals on Wheels America, which I mentioned is the National Provider Association, um, members have a waiting list which average 200 
older adults. And yes, sir. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, yeah. Correct. So they're they're reporting that. Um, so they're reporting that they're serving fewer meals, and this is both um, because of increase in food costs as well as um, reductions in funding for the programs. And funding for home delivered meals is primarily comes from the Older Americans Act, but it's matched by state dollars as well as um, there's charitable contributions as well. So all of that, unfortunately, has been um, on the decline compared to 2005. Mm -hmm. So there are some... Um, current policy recommendations that are supported by this research. Um, one, as I mentioned, that was put forward by the National Commission on Hunger was to expand Medicare managed care to cover home delivered meals, meaning that these HMO and Medicare Advantage plans can now reimburse or should, their, their argument is that they should be able to reimburse for um, nutrition and home delivered meal services. Similar, similarly, um, calls are out for Medicaid managed care to do the same. Um, our research also supports recommendations to protect and bolster funding for the Older Americans Act nutrition programs. Um, it's estimated that it would cost 6.1, and I just want to put this into perspective for you all. Um, so it's estimated that it would cost $6.1 billion to provide meals to the 9.8 million older adults who are currently struggling with hunger. Um, but with the funding levels of 2017 being about $677 million, um, programs are only able to reach about 2.4 million older adults with the current resources that they have available. There are some other policy recommendations related to nutrition services for older adults. Um, one is to standardize nutrition screening in healthcare settings. So that would be to add malnutrition and food insecurity screenings to um, admission and discharge processes from inpatient settings, meaning that when a patient is admitted to a hospital that they could be screened for food insecurity or malnutrition, uh, or, as well as when they're discharged so that appropriate services and supports can be put into place. Um, there's also recommendations to include, in, um, include nutrition screening in um, CMS's annual wellness checkup, as well as their welcome to Medicare exam. So every new Medicare beneficiary um, who turns 65 now, six, yeah, 65 and qualifies for Medicare, um, has to, or has a new, doesn't have to, but it's recommended that they have an exam. And so one of the recommendations is to include nutrition-related screenings in that. And then another recommendation is to defend and support uh, the SNAP program as well as the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, which are also vital um, nutrition services to for older adults. So now I want to share with you some of the work that we're currently doing um, in, the, in efforts to continue to build the business case for home delivered meals as well as expand um, their services and capabilities. So um, I'm terrible with titles, and we, so we're calling this next set of work More Than a Meal Phase 2. Um, we have three phases of More Than a Meal research, and um, so it's become the More Than a Meal research, research studies. Um, but with this, we are attempting to address some of the limitations from the RCT that I glazed over quickly, which were um, we had 626 participants, which isn't a huge number, um, so our sample size was somewhat limited to detect uh, statistically significant effects and um, and some outcomes that have lower rates of probability, as well as um, the limitation of self-report. So we looked at self-reported hospitalizations and falls, and for anyone who does survey research or primary data collection, you know that those can sometimes be subject to social desirability bias, particularly in the older adult population. So we're linking um, Meals on Wheels client data with Medicare claims so that we can examine healthcare utilization and costs, um, particularly hospitalizations, emergency department visits, and nursing home placement. And I will share with you a preview of some of those findings. Um, so these are still preliminary, but were exciting, and I thought you'd enjoy seeing them. Um, so what we have found with our link of Meals on Wheels data to Medicare claims is that Meals on Wheels clients have poor health. And you all might say, like, this is really groundbreaking. Um, but 
programs aren't required to collect this information, so we really didn't have an idea on a national level um, the healthcare conditions of clients in Meals on Wheels programs. And as you see here, um, in terms of demographics, the majority are female, uh, over a third are over the age of 85, and 74% are white, meaning that um, there's a higher proportion of minorities that are receiving home-delivered meals than in the general population of older adults. 90% um, have a diagnosis of hypertension, about 80% with hyperlipidemia, um, over 40% with depression, over a third with COPD, so this is a pretty um, frail uh, and vulnerable group. And what's to be mentioned is these are not mutually exclusive, so a lot of individuals have these comorbid conditions placing them at an increased risk. Um, with these new data, we've also been able to examine their utilization before receiving meals as well as after receiving meals. And what we found is that individuals who received home delivered meals, um, they experienced about a 39% reduction in their inpatient hospitalizations after receiving meals compared to the 30 days before, 38% um, at, at 90 days before, at 90 days after compared to 90 days before, um, similar reductions in emergency department visits and nursing home stays. Um, and the third phase of our More Than a Meal research pro um, pro program is Basically, we're continuing our partnership with Meals on Wheels America. And as economic sources are still straining these programs, um, we're helping them think about ways that they can capitalize on their existing resources and the model that they have, meaning they're in individuals' homes every day. Um, so we're looking to help them partner with healthcare providers by saying, you know, we're in your patients' homes every day. We see them. We can report on their changing conditions. Um, and so the way we're doing this is with an electronic application in which um, drivers will indicate whether or not clients have had a change in their health um, so that they can then be uh, paired up with community, excuse me, with health partners for ongoing monitoring and evaluation. So the aims of the study, the first aim was basically to understand are Meals on Wheels programs capable of this type of partnership and intervention. So we conducted site visits at six programs across the country in an effort to understand their workflow and their delivery process and how something like this might be um, implemented in Meals on Wheels programs. And then the second aim was to implement a standardized training for drivers as well as um, a change in condition <coughs> mobile application in two pilot sites. And so the way that this is happening is that drivers have a tablet that they take with them that has their routes and you know client A, B, C, D and who they're going to see. And then if they witness a change in a variety of indicators, which I'll share in a second, um, they'll indicate whether or not there's a change that's then followed up on by a care navigator at the program. So we are evaluating this process as a pilot for a larger rollout. Um, and we, as I mentioned, this is in two sites. I'll only present data from one, um, particularly that one in San Diego, California, in which we monitored um, the pro this process for six months. And we trained drivers to use this mobile application. The responses then were sent to a care navigator at the Meals on Wheels program in which they helped the client identify what their needs were and what resources might meet those needs. And we collected data on those alerts as well as focus groups with drivers at the two sites to understand what the drivers thought about this new, um, to, about their satisfaction with the tool. And what we found was that um, in our pilot phase at the San Diego site, we had six, no, so we had seven drivers, seven routes, and you estimate anywhere from 12 to 15 clients per route. And in that six month process, um, that six month time period, there were 91 alerts that were made for 30 clients. Um, 18 of those clients had multiple alerts during this time period. And the major, or the, the top alert that came in was for health. So this was either a physical health or mental health um, condition. 18 alerts were for self-care. So this was concerns about individuals' um, ability, you know, either bathing or dressing, or they maybe weren't taking the best, you know, self-care of themselves. Um, 
14 alerts came in for concerns about the environment in which they lived, so it's maybe safety concerns or hazards. 11 with mobility, so getting around the house or getting in and out of the house. Nine alerts came in for social engagement, so these were things like um, a caregiver or a client's caregiver who drove them to church on Sunday may have died or gone into the nursing home, and so there was an alert made saying that the, um, this client's social engagement was threatened, and seven alerts came in for nutrition. And then we tracked what the care navigator did with these alerts, and um, we found that the top um, outcome was that they assisted with self-care or care management for this individual. Um, they hooked five people up with transportation um, assistance. They addressed nutritional needs. They referred um, three clients with concerns of elder abuse um, and one resulted in emergent medical follow-up. So had this process not been there, um, not been put in place, it's likely that drivers would have still called the program or when the volunteers got back to the office, they'd say, you know, I'm concerned about Mrs. So-and-so or, you know, something that somebody just needs to check in. But, so it's likely that would have still happened, but with this training, they now know to look for it. And with this tool, it's now standardized and easy. So as they walk out of the house, they're like, oh, I don't know if this person looks so good. So they hit an alert and it's followed up on. Um, and when we spoke to drivers and focus groups, they reported just that. And they said that the tablet was easy to use. You know, a lot of times we think about older adults uh, adaptability of technology not to be a very positive experience but in this case um, with the majority of drivers being older adults you know they found it was easy to use granted there were some improvements that they recommended um, but most importantly they felt as though they were making an important contribution by um, alerting these referrals alerting these conditions and then them being referred and followed up on so in terms of next steps, um, we have a positive pilot. So this project demonstrates the viability of this application that could be scalable across the Meals on Wheels network to make electronic wellness checks during their routine meal delivery. Um, we've expanded this project to a second site in Ohio, and we're currently collecting data on the um, the client alerts as well as the outcomes. And the goal is to expand this throughout the Meals on Wheels America network. Um, and from a research standpoint, I'd love to do a rigorous evaluation of this rollout. So um, what will the policy and practice impacts of this and future work be? You will have to stay tuned. Um, I'd love to you know, continue to chat with you all and hear your thoughts and share our findings. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to share this work with you today, and um, I'd love to engage with you in questions and a fruitful discussion that follows. So, thank you.